Uh, okay, welcome everyone um, to the first talk of this year for the String Field Theory Journal Club. Today we have Georg Stettinger with us and he'll tell us about open string field theory with stubs. Over to you, Georg. Okay, so hello everyone. And first, uh, thanks for the invitation and for the possibility to talk here. I hope you all can hear me well. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, good. Yes, so please, if you have questions, just, just interrupt me because right now I'm just seeing my screen, so I don't have, have any, any feedback. But I will then just start, I guess. So, yes, I'm talking about open string field theory with stops uh, based on my last two papers together with uh, Martin Schnabel. And yeah, the second paper should actually have appeared on the archive already, but unfortunately, we had some latex problem, so it will appear within the next days. And just to give an, an overview and outline, so I will uh, start with some introduction and, and motivation for the work and explain uh, why stops uh, in open string field theory are interesting and what are the reasons to study them. Then I will give a bit of introduction to tensor co-algebras because this will be the the mathematical language that I will mostly use um, throughout this this talk. Yes, and then uh, do some more concrete things, namely how to find the higher products of the resulting infinity algebra that we can, will get, and also how to obtain uh, the chromomorphisms, which means the maps that map solutions of written theory to the solutions of the stubbed theory. I will explain that in detail. And in the last section, uh, we will generalize the whole thing to the sliver frame and apply it on some explicit, uh, explicitly known solutions and get some explicit uh, results of solutions of this uh, infinity-based theory. And then, yeah, in the end, give some, some summary and interpretation and, and outlook. Okay. So first, I will start with some basic things for, for the notation of, of, of string field theory in general. So for open strings, we have the written action, this uh, transcend type uh, action with this quite simple looking equations of motion. So here, just to explain the ingredients, the Q is uh, the BOST operator. The M2, this is the maybe most important thing, is the written star product which uh, describes the joining of two strings into one. And finally, the omega, I use this notation, is a bilinear form given by the BPC product in the, in the background CFT. So we know that the psi is some element of, in this case, a boundary CFT, which uh, describes our background on which we formulate the theory. And in this CFT, we always have the BPC product available. So this will be the, the bilinear form used to write down the action. So this action has some quite nice properties. So first, uh, those ingredients that I just uh, described form a cyclic differential graded algebra. This means we have a differential given by Q that squares to zero. We have a product M2, which is associative. And we have a cyclic structure, namely we have this omega, which is compatible with the, with, the, with the Q and the M2. So this means, for example, that I can move the Q onto the first argument up to a sign, or I can move the M2 on the first two arguments up to a sign. So there is some compatibility relation between the bilinear form and the elements of the algebra. This is meant by cyclic. So from those properties, it follows that we have gauge invariance. The gauge invariance is given by this expression. So this will be important because when we modify the theory later on, we want to keep this gauge invariance. So that's why I mentioned it here. And then there's one other very important fact. So if we use this action as a basis for a quantum field theory and um, write down Feynman rules and con construct all Feynman diagrams, then we find out that those Feynman diagrams indeed cover the full moduli space of Riemann surfaces with boundaries, which is important because we need this property to have uh, a unitary uh, string field theory in the end. So we know that from, from the path integral approach, when, when we write down a, 
we have to sum over all different world sheets, basically. So we have to sum over the full moduli space of, of those world sheet surfaces. And every world sheet has to be uh, has to be counted once and only once. And this action has the property that is indeed the case. And yes, we will keep that in mind because it will be important later on. Okay, then as opposed to that, uh, some things about closed strings. So for closed strings, the action looks a bit more complicated. Um, the kinetic term is almost the same, just that we have now uh, both sectors like holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, so we don't have a boundary CFT, but a normal CFT without boundary in with the string fin lifts. But then we have infinitely many vertices here, given by those products LN, which are symmetric multilinear products in this case, combined with some symplectic form to uh, yeah, give rise to these vertices. And as a result, also the equations of motion have infinitely many terms given by this expression here. So the Q and the LN in this case form a cyclic L infinity algebra. So as I mentioned, they are totally symmetric. That's also a difference to the open string case. And also here we have gauge invariance in this case given by this expression. So also the gauge transformation has infinitely many terms involving all the LNs. So we know that for open string field theory, we already have some classical analytic solutions known. Uh, most importantly, or most famously, the tachyon vacuum in its various forms. Uh, I will use this form here for uh, later on. So this is a also physically important solution because it describes the endpoint of, of tachyon condensation. So for open strings, since the algebraic structure here is relatively simple of the action, we have a lot of uh, algebraic tools available. And for closed strings, that's not the case. So far, we have no analytic solutions known, and the algebraic tools are more limited. And the reason for that is, or at least one important reason is, yeah, that the equations just look much more complicated. We have infinitely many vertices. And also the LNs itself, they are quite complex objects because they involve some integration over subregions of the moduli space, over like vertex regions. And it's already quite non-trivial to identify and to make those vertex regions complete. And then still you have to define the differential forms that you're integrating and so on. So they, those LNs involve uh, quite a lot of mathematical structure, which makes it uh, not so easy to find uh, exact solutions, analytic solutions. So now we come to the motivation of why stop. So basically, we want to get the theories more close to each other. So in this case, we, we want to modify the open string field theory such that it looks a little bit more like closed string field theory. So, uh, yeah, how do we do that? Um, we will follow one, one attempt to do that, which is we will attach uh, pieces of propagating string to the free vertex. So we will modify the product. The, the star product M2 will get modified to this expression here. And we see that we have this operator e to the minus lambda L0 acting on the two inputs of the product and also on the output. So. This is basically a time evolution operator because we know like a L0 in the CFT generates time translations. So this, this operator just propagates the string for a certain amount of time given by lambda before taking the product and afterwards. So I have, um, I have made a little sketch here. I, can you see the, the picture? Yeah, we can see the picture. Okay, great. So the, this is like the standard vertex, just very schematically. So Psi 1 and Psi 2 are two string fins that we want uh, to multiply. They come in here and give result to another string called the product M2. And we want to modify this to this picture here, where they are first translated or time translated by an amount of lambda. And then also the output is time translated. So this is what we will, have, what we will call the stopped product. OK. So, yeah, one immediate 
problem or thing is the, the theory based on this product will not be gauge invariant anymore if you just do this naively. And the reason is because this product capital M2 is not associative. So this is something that needs to get repaired. And the second thing is that the moduli space will not be covered anymore. And this we can also see from here. I just draw uh, a little four point amplitude. If we see, if we bring two of those stopped vertices together, then there will be a surface in between here that is part of the propagator, which will always be bigger than two lambda. So for example, a surface like here that could appear in written theory where this, this piece here is very small, is smaller than two lambda, this will be missed in this theory. So we, we will miss some, some world sheet surfaces, which is also a problem. And we will see in, in a couple of minutes how to solve that. So the solution to both of the problems, as we will see, is to introduce higher products to compensate. So our differential graded algebra will turn into an A-infinity algebra. We will introduce a capital M3 and capital M4 and so on, such that the whole thing together is again gauge invariant. And also we will see that the modelized space problem will be solved. Okay, um, yeah, before doing that, uh, again, a little bit more of motivation. I mean, so far it seems like we just want to make a simple theory more complicated. Well, uh, that's the case, but there is a good reasons for that. I mean, first, as I already mentioned, we want to make it a bit more similar to closed string field theory that we then learn something about uh, structure of analytic solutions. So although it, of course, will not be completely the same, but at least we will have the case of infinitely many products and infinitely many vertices in the action. And also we will see some integrals over, over moduli that also appear in closed string field theory. So it's definitely closer. And also um, if we look at uh, closed string field theory, especially the quantized closed string field theory, then we need we need stops there to make the theory consistent. So that the stop is not an is is something which is needed and which will also play a role in a combined open closed SFT. So since in the end of the day this will be the goal to to combine the two sectors, then also the open string sector will need some stops to make the whole thing in the whole quantum theory consistent. And also a third motivation, the stops might uh, regularize certain singularities that appear because uh, written theory sometimes suffers from singularity issues. For example, there are solutions which are described by basically a vanishing world sheet surface. They look uh, algebraically super simple and solve the equations of motions in, in one line, but you cannot compute an action, for example, because uh, things are ill-defined. And there are good reasons to believe that in the stopped theory, where you have those security strips, those um, strips of world sheet added on all the vertices, um, those kind of singularities will be regularized. So yes, there's uh, by far enough motivation to study a stopped open string field theory. And now before moving on, um, yeah, what we will, what are the three tasks that we have to, that we will uh, aim for? So first, uh, we need to find the higher products to complete the infinity algebra. That's the first thing to do. And then, of course, we want would like to study solutions in this deformed theory. So we would like to find a transformation that maps solutions of the original theory of written theory to solutions of the deformed theory. And as a last point, we will also explicitly do that. Let's, for example, take a specifically interesting theory like the tachyon vacuum and compute it explicitly in the stopped theory. So those three tasks uh, we will answer or solve to some extent. And yeah, before, oh, I think there is a, headline missing. But yeah, before starting with that, I will give a bit of overview about tensor co-algebras and some notions which are important to in this in, in the rest of the talk. So first, a, a few definitions. 
So the tensor co-algebra TV of some some graded vector space, it, we can just imagine as the Fox space. So the the sum of all tensor powers of V. And when we speak about the co-derivation, it's usually associated to some M linear map. Let's say we have some M product, which takes uh, M arguments of V and maps them to V. Then we can associate to it a co-derivation, which is of this form. This just means it takes like M adjacent elements of every tensor power and fills up the rest with unities here. So if when I talk about the, the co-derivation associated to some map, then it's always this expression. So, I mean, there is a more more formal and more mathematical definition, but I think that's not, not necessary in, in this point. It's just important to know what to mean. And the general co-derivation is, is a linear combination of elements of this form. So usually you have multiple DMs for different Ms, and they are added together. And we can recover the the elementary maps just by projecting appropriately. So first projecting to M inputs, then apply this thing, and then projecting to one output gives us back the, the DM. Okay. So uh, one very important fact, if you have some co-derivative with, with, with uh, which squares to zero, then it's elements DM for an, form an A-infinity algebra. That's maybe the most uh, concise and most elegant definition of an A-infinity algebra. And as soon as we have one available, we can always write down uh, gauge invariant equations of motion, where the gauge transformation is given in a very simple way using those DMs. And the next definition that we need is the, uh, the notion of a cohomomorphism. So again, when we have given a family of some M products, in, uh, I call them FM here, we can construct this map here. This just means we apply the FM in all possible combinations on the whole tensor product. And again, we can uh, recover the individual FMs by projecting appropriately on M inputs and one output. And the important relation between those two definitions is that we have, if we have an infinitesimal cohomomorphism, which very, which is considered as small, then we can always expect it as one plus epsilon of something, and this something will turn out to be a co-derivation. So this is quite easy to see from this, from these two definitions, uh, like this definition and this one. If I ex expand in some small epsilon, then I will get the other one. So uh, the cohomomorphism is, is important for us because in the end it will be will uh, be used for the maps that map solutions to solutions. So that's why it's uh, important to remember. So uh, to make those things a bit more concrete and uh, show why they are useful, I will write down the written equations of motion using uh, co-algebra elements. So. I can turn the BOST operator and the written product into a co-derivative and sum them up. And if I act on these elements, so the, the 1 over 1 minus Psi, this is just a, a, a formal notation for uh, Psi plus Psi tensor Psi plus Psi tensor Psi tensor Psi and so on, like a, a geometric series in tensor products. And if this object, this can come, one can define this sum as a, some as a small m, is zero, then this is equivalent to the written equation of motion uh, that I had can be seen very easily. And this also works for the for the stop equations of motion that we expect. Here we just sum up all the infinitely many products. Again, act on this element here, and if it's zero, then the equations of motion are obeyed. And if we square this, this element m, so then it will simultaneously encode, for example, that q squared is zero. For written theory, it will encode uh, Leibniz and uh, associativity of m2. While for the stopped theory, we have Leibniz and all the other infinity relations. So associativity will, in general, not be given anymore. OK. Um, so now we will move on to the higher products. Um, are, are there questions so far?
Okay, good. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about homotopy transfer because this will be the, the method how the higher products can be obtained. Um, so in general, homotopy transfer is a method to transfer some algebraic structure from one uh, differential vector space to another, from one chain complex to another. And I will first talk about the the most typical case in the literature, which is called a special deformation retract or SDR. So we have some vector space V and we have a subspace of it called W. And then we have a natural projection and inclusion maps given by P and I that fulfill uh, PI equals one. So it's important that those projection and inclusions commute with the differential. I denote the differential by Q here just to make it not too confusing. Uh, and we usually have a homotopy H that obeys this very important relation here, the, the Hodge-Codaira relation, that basically says that if I take IP in this in this order, so that I first project and then include, then its difference to identity is given by some, some anti-commutator with Q. So this is not zero here, but it's one says it's homotopic to zero. So it has this form. Um, and yeah, usually when we talk about a special deformation retract, we also demand those annihilation conditions here or side conditions. Um, yeah, they are practical and often a bit, but we will later see that they are not strictly necessary. Um, and what, what we can do now is something called the tensor trick, we can lift all of the maps to the tensor co-algebra over the respective vector spaces, and we will get a new homotopy equivalence, given, so the Q will turn into a co-derivative, the I and the P will turn into co-homomorphisms, and the H will be a little bit strange object, but uh, I will not give the details here, but it's just important that uh, it's always possible to get this new homotopy equivalence with those tensor algebra elements. And then we can use the, oh, uh, sorry. Um, we can do a perturbation and we can use this thing called homological perturbation lemma. And we will perturb by the product M2. So we will add to the co-derivative Q, we will add the new product, which we can do in the, in the tensor co-algebra. We can add those elements together. And we will, again, get something that squares to zero, as we have seen before. And then the perturbation lemma tells us that we can have, find a new special deformation retract given by these maps. And again, um, I might show this in a little sketch to make it a bit more understandable. So this was the first case that we started from. We have a vector space V with differential Q. We have a subspace of it. We can project onto the subspace and include the subspace into the bigger one. And we have those homotopy H that can act on, on V, fulfilling the, the relations that I shown to you. And then the next step is to lift all the maps to the tensor algebra. So the Old letters always means tensor co-algebra elements. And then finally, we can do the perturbation. So I perturb the Q to a Q plus M2. Have still something that squares to zero here. I get still some, I can define some projection and inclusion, which take a slightly different form. And most importantly, on the second space, I will also get some new differential. I call it capital M now that squares to zero, and this will inc uh, encode our new product. Because we know uh, a code derivation that squares to zero gives rise to an A infinity algebra, and this is exactly what happens. So even if this algebra like terminates at M2, this is not the case for the perturbed one. So in, in general, we will get infinitely many higher products contained in this M. Um, Yeah, yeah. So this M is the, for, for now the most important object. The P also will be important later on, but first focus on the M. As I said, the M encodes the algebra on the resulting space. 
And now, okay, we want to apply that thing for our our stops problem. So for example, we can look at the capital M2 we get. This is quite a natural, a natural expression that comes out because it's given by this object. So what happens here? We we just take two elements, we include them both into the bigger space, then use the product on the bigger space and then project back. This is probably the most natural product that I can define. But this is in general not associative and this is also the, the reason why in general we will get an infinity algebra and not just a normal algebra. And if we want to use this for stops, we already made like a, how to say, a postulate how, the, how our capital M2 should look like, namely, um, I can show it again, namely this one, e to the minus the element and we see if we want this to come out, then we just need to define, okay, I and P should be equal, should be equal to this stop operator. But now we say, okay, this is will not give rise to a deformation retract because neither this I is an inclusion nor the P is a projection nor the annihilation conditions are fulfilled or, or anything. So we will need a generalization of this of this case. So what we can do, and what is the first task, we can solve for the homotopy. So we can solve the Hodge-Codera relation. And this is the simplest, but not unique choice, but it's the simplest one. And it's important that this can be written in this integral form. This will be important in a moment because it resembles the Schwinger parameterization of the propagator. So if, if we would take the integral here from zero to infinity, we would have the propagator in Siegel gauge. And it's not a coincidence that this can be in a very similar way, but uh, we will come to that in a moment. Okay, so now we can just move on and pretend we don't care and calculate this M. I call it M naive now because we will see it's, it's not what we want. Uh, it does square to zero, but it's not a co-derivation because just uh, those properties of uh, the pi equals one and annihilation conditions are, are necessary for, this, for the whole thing to work. So this does not give rise to an infinity algebra. But the solution is quite simple. Uh, what we can do is we can just pretend that all SDR relations are satisfied. So what we will do is we will just drop every term containing one of those expressions that are supposed to vanish. And we will replace every pi i by unity. And what we get is indeed a code derivation which also fulfills m squared equals zero. So it encodes an infinity algebra. So, I mean, this might seem a bit hand wavy, but it can be proven in a much more formal way using operate theory. But for our purposes, this is perfectly fine to use this uh, recipe to get the higher products. And it can be proven that uh, all necessarily necessary properties are fulfilled. So in this way, we have succeeded to construct our higher products and complete the infinity algebra. And now uh, there's something very nice about it because it's known also from uh, more formal mathematical theories that the MN contracted, uh, constructed in this way is the sum of all binary rooted planar trees where I put this operator on the root and on the leaves. More, uh, more precisely, uh, I is put on the leaves and P on the root, but in our case here, they are equal. And M2, the product on the vertices, and H on the internal lines. And this exactly corresponds to, to three-level Feynman diagrams. And not only that, it exactly corresponds to those who, which were missed before. If we remember, uh, if we remember, okay, not this picture, right? Okay, anyway, I don't have it here anymore. But we remember there, there were some, some diagrams missed. And those are exactly those that, that I added now because we have seen before the H has this nice integral form here. So it, it is part of the propagator where the, the strip attached between the, the two vertices is as length from two from zero to two lambda, and those, as I as I should have shown before, those were those uh, surfaces which were missed. So we recovered exactly the property 
I was talking before that the Feynman diagrams need to cover the full modularized base of the theory. Okay. So, yeah, this is actually nice. And now what we want, we want to find maps which map solutions to solutions and we will do this in the form of cohomomorphisms. So what we are looking for is a cohomomorphism I call it A now in general, that obeys this relation. So that it, it intertwines between the written algebra and the stopped algebra. Because if this relation is true, we can uh, straightforwardly see by using the property that um, is obeyed by any chromomorphism that I can move it into the Psi here. So this object is zero if the small m annihilates psi. So if psi is a solution to written theory, then a of one or monomized psi, this object here will be a solution of the stop theory. So as soon as we have found such a, we have we know how to construct the solutions. And we already have a candidate for it. Namely, we have this p, this p from before. Because this p from before here, this one, it obeys the train map relation, the, so the, the commutation with the differentials, and this is ex exactly the relation we need, namely exactly this one. So again, we cannot just take p naive, but we have to improve it because uh, we don't have a special deformation retract. So again, we pretend that the relations are true, do the same thing as before, and we get a fin uh, transformation I call it P now that indeed maps solutions to solutions. So this was actually given for free by the perturbation lemma. And now uh, we wanted to see what happens on the level of actions. So what, what, what we actually did was we computed the transformed action. So I call it S tilde now, uh, S tilde of let, um, yeah, P minus one here um, acting on Psi. And yeah, what we got was not really what we expected because it gave rise to this a little bit uh, strange action with a lot of operators. We see also that the kinetic term, for example, is not the standard kinetic term that we expected. We expected to find this here, this uh, uh, yeah, standard infinity action. And what we got was uh, a little bit uh, strange. But it's actually not, uh, not that big of a surprise. I mean, we have the same equations of motion. This is, this is still fulfilled. But the problem is that the P is not cyclic. So it does not respect the bilinear form. And we cannot even expect that it does this because the homological perturbation lemma does not know anything about the symplectic form. This enters nowhere. So we, can, we cannot hope that it's uh, automatically fulfilled. And if we want to find a cyclic homomorphism that also is compatible with this symplectic form, we have to do something else. We have to find it by other methods. And yeah, to find it by alpha method, it was uh, very useful to take inspiration from closed string field theory. So there is a paper by uh, Bagdan Zwiebach and, and Hatter from the 90s where they analyze uh, basically exactly this problem. They analyze uh, different decompositions of moduli space and, and show that they are related by some nonlinear field redefinition. So an expression like this, which is just what we want, like a chromomorphism acting on, on Psi. And so the idea was to translate this to open string field theory and Even uh, so, the, first we, we consider an infinitesimal change in the stub length. So we say lambda goes to lambda plus delta lambda. And this was actually explicitly done in this paper. Uh, they found first, oh, sorry, so I touched the mouse. Here we are, yes. So first, it, it's easy to see that the first term in the expansion has to be unity if we want to preserve the kinetic term. And for the higher Fs, uh, in this paper, this ansatz was given that Psi just goes to Psi plus Delta Lambda plus, and then uh, the BV bracket of Psi with some generator E. And the generator E was given in, a, in an explicit form. 
Here, of course, using all the formalism of closed ring field theory with these uh, canonical forms that are integrated over vertex regions, and we have a B insertion over some supported by some some Schiffer vector. And it was necessary to let's say deduce the open string equivalent of it, which was not that hard, which is possible. One just has to carry out the BV bracket here in detail. And what we got was this ansatz here, that the Fn, those Fn dependent on lambda were given just by the higher product of lambda with some B not insertions. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sure. So this this homomorphism is to relate uh, um, the the Witten's theory to the the one that doesn't involve this the the action that doesn't involve p minus one size, right? Exactly. Yes. So, yes. Okay. My concern is that the, like in principle, you should be able to show that the, the two actions that you wrote are the same by changing f one psi, right? Like say that you put something like f one psi is like a p times psi. And then like you should you should be able to show that this is like by this formalism, you should be able to show that the uh, end up in a like a one that you get from the, uh, the homological perturbation lemma. So you know, um, are these like I, I, don't know if it, if, I, I don't know if it's that simple. I mean I will say a bit more about the relations of the two actions later. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if, and I think it's not, not not possible to only change F1. One has to change all the Fs. Yeah, just, just change it. Like, but the thing is that the F1 situation, the like writing Psi, F1 Psi is the Psi, is the fact that it's, yeah, it's, it's preserves the kinetic term, right? Yes. But once yes. we like it as well, we should be able to, to get the another one. And like, so I was wondering like, do, okay, maybe I should ask that when you come there, but are these actions really different or related by some field redefinition? They are related by, by some field redefinition, and I, I will come to that uh, in a moment. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other question? Okay, good. Um, yes, so this is the infinitesimal form. Uh, if we want the finite form, we can... Uh, just uh, use a path ordered exponential in, in the same way as we do it for, for parallel transport, for example. And if you write it out, uh, I write it out for until uh, uh, quadratic order in, in Psi now, we get uh, this expression. And now, indeed, we have found the comomorphism that we were looking at, that if I enter it into the action, I get the S prime, where the S prime was the expected one, so this form of the action with the standard kinetic term. So we succeeded in uh, finding a cyclic homomorphism, but yeah, there are still open questions, and I think this is uh, so we can ask, for example, is there even a more general family of homomorphisms? And when, and yeah, what's the meaning of the two different actions? Because I mean, they have the same equations of motion, but still a manifestly different form. And for example, we know that, that the on-shell value of the action is an important physical quantity. It, it's usually the total energy of the deep brain system. So this should not defer for some specific solution. And this is what we will uh, answer now. So uh, it's, it's practical to analyze this intertwiner condition infinitesimally. So, what we do is we expand the A, A of lambda and delta lambda as one plus delta lambda uh, small a, where this small a is a co-derivation. As we saw before, an infinitesimal comomorphism uh, yields a co-derivation here. Um, and then we arrive at this equation. And this is a yeah, equation with uh, linear equation with in, in homogeneity. So we can first uh, look at the homogeneous part without the uh, right hand side. And this, for example, this equation has uh, this family of solutions here. So we can take for the A1 uh, some arbitrary combination of Virasoros, and then it follows that the A uh, the, for and bigger than two are given by this expression. So 
this is not these are not not all solutions there are more actually i'm just uh, focusing on those because of, for simplicity and they are sufficient for what we wanted to show but one could in principle even consider like higher products of mirror servers one could uh, quadratic or cubic products or whatever so uh there are more solutions than those, but uh, it, it's, I think, for the purpose enough to focus on those. And we have a nice interpretation because we can uh, define this lambda here this, this, as a gauge parameter. And what happens then, if I plug this in and act with a small a on psi, what I get is the first line is just a gauge transformation involving this lambda. And the second line is a part which is proportional to the equations of motions for Psi. So this has the following effect. Uh, for on-shell fields, for the, this part will vanish and we will just have a gauge transformation. Uh, but in general, off-shell, this of course is, is not zero. So we, when, when we insert this into an action, we will see that the on-shell value will be the same, but off-shell behavior will be changed. And this is exactly what happened for our two actions uh, before. So their, their off-shell form is, is not identical because this, this term matters. But if we, if we uh, plug in some solutions, they will give the same value because then the difference is just the gauge transformation. And also they have the same equations of motion because if, yeah, if the equations of, if we perturb the equations of motion by the equations of motion, we still arrive at the same. So this uh, somehow explains the this uh, question about the two different actions. Yeah, I just thought it's good news because, as I said, the angel action is a physical quantity, so we really want it to be pres uh, preserved. And yeah, for, for completeness, I, I gave also the solution for the inhomogeneous equation here. We can just... Uh, at any particular solution, so I took the I took the infinitesimal f from before. So uh, where was it? This one here, and added it to it, and then we arrive at this more general uh, solution for the infinitesimal homomorphism. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now we want to uh, move on to the. A second or last part where uh, we generalize the whole construction to this liver frame. So, so why is this liver frame interesting? So first it's quite a simple thing. It just uh, consists of a conformal transformation that goes to uh, inverse tangent of Z. But it has the property that the star product uh, simplifies considerably. And that's the reason why most of the analytic solutions are formulated in this liver frame and also a lot of the algebraic tools which were developed in, in string field theory, in open string field theory, rely on this liver frame. And most importantly, the tachyon vacuum, which uses uh, elements of the KBC algebra, um, also is also formulated in this liver frame. So, I mean, we could still compute the psi tachyon vacuum using the homomorphisms we had, like the f or the p, but it would be quite inconvenient because the, the ordinary Verosoros, the e to the minus lambda l naught, does not have a nice action on, on psi TV. It, it would be very tedious and probably not, not a very nice result. So, it's much more natural to use uh, the sliver frame analogs of the stubs and generalize the stub theory to the sliver frame. And this is what we will do now. So we will change the stub operator to its curly analog, to its uh, sliver frame analog. And the first thing we realized that the curly analog is not BPC even. So if we want to have a cyclic vertex, then our capital M2 should have an L0 star here and not an L0 because this will act on the other side of the PPC product. So far, that's not a big thing. We, we just have that I and P are not equal anymore, but we can carry on uh, in the normal way. Um, what's, what's interesting, if we solve for the homotopy, for example, 
um, we need to solve this equation. And the most straightforward way to do this is to use the algebraic properties of the curly L0 and curly L0 star and write this uh, in this way, basically using the uh, baker campbell hausdorff formula. And in this way, we can have a natural solution given by this expression, where we just replace uh, the B0 by uh, the sum of B0 and B0 star, or we also call it B0 hat sometime. And again, this has uh, the interpretation of an integral here. So it, it looks like uh, a part of a Schwinger representation of a propagator, in this time in this uh, B0 hat gauge. And yes, um, this raises questions because we have seen before that H is essentially part of the propagator when we uh, sum over Feynman diagrams. So it also needs to be in the same gauge as the propagator. And this B0 hat gauge is quite unusual to lose. Uh, what it's what more, what is more, uh, I would say more common is the sliver gauge which just uh, means a uh, curly B not on size zero, which is, for example, obeyed by the Tachyon vacuum. And if we uh, look at the propagate and sliver gauge, this was, uh, I think, analyzed in detail in the paper by uh, Zwiebach and Sen and Kiermaier, I think. Um, we have this expression, and this expression is interesting because uh, it contains those projectors, those uh, pop P minus and P plus uh, projectors on states of even and odd ghost number. So the form of the propagator depends of the go on the ghost number of the input. And this, and the second interesting thing is that we have like two, two denominators, which means two Schwinger integrals. This almost looks like an overcounting of moduli space, but it's not because the overcounting is canceled by this Q in the middle here. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, if we want to find H in the sliver gauge, then uh, it needs it certainly needs to look different than this thing here. So what we will do now, we will compute a four-point amplitude. We will do it directly via uh, Feynman diagram techniques. So first, let's look at the four-point amplitude, basically the one that I, I wrote down before on the paper, and see how to compute it in Witten theory. So in Witten theory, we would just wrote down something like this, like having a product of, of uh, let's say two incoming fields, apply the propagator on, with the right ghost number, and then multiply it to the next one. And then we have to include some permutations, like if this is the S channel, then we have to include the T channel as well, and maybe some, some symmetry factors, but that's not so important for the moment. We just uh, want to see the structure. And if we do the same in the stubbed theory, so first we have to use the capital M2, the one that contains the stubs, and we also need to add the elementary four-point vertex here, given by this M3. So, and if we just compare the two and focus on on-shell states, then we find this equation. So on-shell states just means that we neglect stops acting on the, on the incoming and outgoing fields because uh, yeah, they will be. Uh, they will annihilate, annihilate them. So we can, if we want to compare this to this expression, we we have basically a solution for our age. And this solution, like up to uh, q exact terms, gives us this age in sliver gauge by this expression here. So. But that's not yet the final answer. We still need to think about the ghost number dependence. So here, for example, this H was acting on on a piece with ghost number two. So we don't know yet how it looks like on ghost number one or in general odd ghost numbers. And we find that the right answer is given by this expression. So again, we have we need to make it ghost number dependent. Otherwise, we cannot obey the Hodge-Curie relation. So when we compute the anti commutator with Q, then the ghost number dependencies of importance. 
So we get this as a final result for our homotopy in sliver gauge. And yeah, basically now we're done. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so how, is it trivial to say that this is also going to appear in higher uh, Feynman diagrams? Say that I compute like a five point uh, interaction and like yes. put these facts from the like a lower order and this is what I'm going to end up in the, if I follow the same procedure. Because in the stub, I am guaranteed to have that, right? Because of this flat, uh, like a strip picture. But in the case of slivers, I mean, there are like this infinite coverings of moduli spaces. And in a sense mm -hmm. that you're putting this cutoff again. And it is not obvious to me like how it will, like this is going to be universal answer for the whole, whole disk with punctures. Is it obvious or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Yeah. So you, you mean if, if, this, if this goes through to all, uh, all Feynman diagrams of arbitrary order, the yes, argument. Sorry. I, actually, I I don't know if it's trivial. Um, I, I assumed it to be correct, but yeah, you, you're right. I mean, I I did not check it really in 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 the last detail, so maybe maybe one 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 should check that okay. and see if 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 the arguments really survive for higher point amplitudes. Okay. Because yes, yeah. the, the 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 canceling of the of the like of the overcounting of modulized space might make it complicated. Yeah, like what that's... I worry is that at each order you're going to get like a different H, because that's mm -hmm. kind of what happens. Mm -hmm. Like some instead of like stops, you have something like hyperbolic. That's kind of what happens. But yeah, anyway. All right, like thank you. Okay. Yes, um, to be honest, we, we didn't we didn't check it explicitly. I, I I assumed that it it goes through to all orders, and you always get the same age. But uh, prob probably it's something that should be should be analyzed uh, in more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's a good point. But yes. Um, in principle, we are now ready to construct our higher products as before using either tree diagrams or the perturbation lemma expression. And by using the for the inclusion this operator for the projection, it's a BBC conjugate. And then we can use either H in sliver gauge or H in B head gauge, depending on the purposes, depending on what we want. And yeah, now. We want to talk about the intertwiners and especially about the specific solutions. So, um, yeah, to construct P is actually quite straightforward because we have our, our formula from the perturbation lemma and we can insert the, again, those R and P given by these terms. And now the, the thing is, what, what do we do for the homotopy? I, it's tempting to use this age in, in sliver gauge that we derived before, mostly because it fits the gauge of the tachyon vacuum, so we can hope for some simplifications. But it does not turn out to be so simple. For, for, for example, in Siegel gauge, it would be easy. So the, the homotopy in Siegel gauge, if we remember it, it was here. This contains a B naught if it's act. If it acts on some field which is in Siegel gauge, it just annihilates the field. This leads to quite big simplifications because because in the formula for the for the p homomorphism in the higher terms, there's all, always some H acting on the field directly appearing. So then all all higher terms would vanish, and the whole homomorphism would have given would be given by the linear term only. So we kind of hoped for something here as well, but it, this does not happen. And the reason is that H on Psi TV is given by this expression and those this curly B naught, which would annihilate uh, Psi tuck in vacuum does not commute with the E to the minus lambda L dot star. So it, this is not zero, but this is uh, not even the only problem. It's not only not zero, it's actually divergent. 
and one can show it explicitly, and we, we did show it explicitly in the paper, then if one carries out this, like uses the commutating algebra and so on, we will find that the Psytacian vacuum contains one term, namely the lowest level term, which has, uh, which happens to have after this application here, curly knot eigenvalue of zero. So one over curly knot zero is ill-defined. And yeah, this means uh, the age in sliver gauge, although it looked nice at the beginning, is not what we can use here. Instead, we will use the other solution, the age in B hat gauge from now on and continue. And we can now compute, uh, yeah, the I call it now uh, Psi prime, which is the solution of the Tachyon vacuum in the, in the uh, stub theory. And it can be done by standard KBC techniques. So um, I, I don't want to go too much into the technical details. Uh, it's uh, in, in the paper, we do it uh, much more carefully and with every step. So I just uh, give the final result here. So it contains of various terms involving uh, KBC elements. We, we have security strips in between and then, uh, yeah, like factors that are familiar from the form of the Tachyon vacuum. And we have one integral here, uh, which co corresponds to one uh, modulus, which needs to be integrated. So, yeah, this formula, uh, this, this expression looks complicated, but still it has some, some peculiar structure, already at quadratic order. And I think it's definitely interesting what happens here. For example, it is not twist symmetric. So twist symmetry basically means that uh, a string field reads the same from written from both sides up to signs, maybe up to Grassmann signs. And the original Tachyon vacuum is twist symmetric, but as soon as we apply the P, it's not anymore. And we conclude that the P violates twist symmetry, and this is uh, probably an interesting fact that should be... Uh, should be analyzed further why this is the case and uh, why or if it can be modified to uh, with, how do you say uh, to to respect the twist symmetry. So there are certainly things that one can analyze about this about this expression, although it looks a bit complicated at first sight. So, um, yeah, finally, uh, we also want to apply our cyclic homomorphism F. So first we have to find what is, what is, the, what is the cyclic homomorphism in the sliver, in the sliver frame. So we make an ansatz based on what we know from before. So before, just to remember what we had. We had this, this ansatz here, or this result. So... F consisted of the of the higher products m lambda n with insertions of b naught in this way. So motivated by this, um, we can make the following answer with some operator x and here uh, to have x star to uh, to gain cyclicity. And then we see basically from the from the conditions derived before on the on the chromomorphisms, on the infinitesimal chromomorphisms, that those two relations have to be obeyed. So the homotopy also enters here. So first we have to make a choice for a homotopy. And again, it's advisable to use the B-hat homotopy because the other one, the, the sliver gauge homotopy will lead to divergences again, as we have shown in the paper. So we will use uh, this homotopy and then it's not hard to see that those equations can be obeyed by the very simple choice that X is just a curly B naught. So we have in some, this is our infinitesimal cyclic homomorphism consisting of the end products with insertions of curly B naught. And if we apply this on the attack and vacuum, then really something simplifies because the B naught annihilates it. So we're just left with the first term. And we get this expression here in the path forward exponential uh, in the finite uh, way. So 
Yeah, to get it, um, to make it a bit more explicit, because this form here is maybe not too enlightening, we will linearize it. We will consider a uh, very small lambda and just work in first order in lambda. And then we get this expression here. And this is already much simpler. This can be computed explicitly. And our result is this one. And this one already looks a lot nicer than what we got from P. And also, this expression here can be seen to obey twist symmetry just by shuffling around the, the fields a little bit and uh, computing the anti commutators It's so. We can see uh, that F uh, respects twist symmetry not only to quadratic order but to any order. This can basically be seen from this uh, from this ansatz here. And we can also see that this uh, solution here is gauge related to what we calculated before, to the more complicated one, at least in the expansion for small lambda, as we have seen here. This is a result from, from the middle of the talk where we saw that for on-shell fields, the two chromomorphisms differ by a gauge transformation. Okay. Yeah, this uh, brings me almost to the end. I see I was a bit faster than expected, but uh, first let me uh, finish with a summary and outlook. Um, so a summary, uh, what, we, what we did do. So we constructed an open string field theory with stops based on an infinity algebra with the goal to understand the structure of infinity solutions a bit better. Uh, we also found a family of nonlinear maps, uh, cohomomorphisms, that, that map solutions of the written theory to solutions of the stopped theory, such that it enables us to compute uh, solutions of the stopped theory explicitly. So we have shown that two such cohomomorphisms in this family in general differ by a combination of a gauge transformation and the field redefinition proportional to the equations of motion. This guarantees that the on shell actions are preserved, but the off shell actions in general can have different form. And yeah, in the end, we also generalized the whole thing to the sliver frame where most of the analytic solutions live, and also computed the tachyon vacuum explicitly in a stopped theory up to some, uh, in some expansion, like up to quadratic order in, in Psi. So to give some outlook about what, what we maybe want to do in the future, yeah, of course, further analyze the structure of those NA infinity solutions and also clarify the role of this twist symmetry, if it is important or not, or if it can be uh, preserved or not in the various, uh, various chromomorphisms that we had. And then one uh, interesting uh, Outlook is to connect with the work by, by Harold and Atakan from last year. There was a very nice paper where they shown that uh, stops can be recast in an auxiliary field. So one can, for example, calculate the auxiliary field explicitly for some known solutions and also try to uh, generalize their construction to the sliver frame to connect the two works uh, a bit better. Yeah, then there was the this proposal that the stopped theory might be less singular, that one can maybe com compute some actions of, of identity-like solutions in the stopped theory. And then, yeah, maybe the most, uh, most well, maybe the most interesting question, so also interesting at least, is yeah, what precisely are the parallels to closed string field theories? So how, how, how close did we get to to close uh, to close strings, and where are the differences, and can we can we infer something about the differences? Can can we make it better? Can we learn something about analytic solutions of of closed string field theory? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. I saw, as I said, I was a bit faster than expected. Um, so we have more and more time for questions and discussions. I get, I guess, and yeah. Just want to thank you for the attention. Okay, so first let us thank Georg for his uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, ask.
I have some questions, but I don't want to monopolize on questions. So. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of questions. Time, Akatan. Just go ahead. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, have you look at this solution when restricted to some level zero, either like, uh, you know, restricting to, to L0 or curly L0 truncation? And how does it look like? Just let, you know, just uh, some scalar field in the stop here. Uh, so, can, can you repeat the question? You, you mean of. So, I, I was asking, like, did you, did you, so you wrote some analytic solution, right? Yes. And say that you expand that analytic solution in like uh, some truncation. Uh, I was wondering like how does it look like? Um, like you. See... Uh, yes, I mean when we when we when we uh, did it for the Tarkin vacuum, we expanded it in the uh, curly and not uh, eigenstates to some extent, just for technical reasons. And for example, when we found this divergence, this was due to uh, a specific curly and not eigenstate, like the lowest. The lowest one in the expansion yeah okay because i was wondering like maybe like just restricting this that some truncation you might be able to resum this series in lambda is, mm -hmm. that, is, it, is it possible mm -hmm. or not that's an interesting point uh we did not try that yet okay but because yeah, we, you know we have the, yeah. the the to to sum the series that's true yes I see. And because we have this work with Ted, right? Like we find mm -hmm. that if you restore that sort of stuff, you get this branch cuts. So, you know, like ah, actually yeah. this lamb, lamb, you know, that series is like has a finite radius of convergence in lambda. And I was wondering, like, did okay, this yes. also have mm -hmm. convergence syllabus? Yes, um, I, I don't know. We, we did not, not try that yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For now, that that's all my questions. Really. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a comment about the cyclicity. Yes. Uh, there is, you know, you can also do perturbation during the cyclic complex, which in some sense is more natural for string theory because uh, because you're really talking about vertices rather than. The mm -hmm, maps, mm -hmm. and then it's automatically cyclic. Then you don't have to worry about this issue. Okay. So this yeah, is the cyclic, I, I, this is cyclic homology is, is the one you can actually initially it was started that way. I think. So okay. Yeah, yeah, so no, I, be... I already asked myself if this exists, but I, I didn't find it anywhere. Is it, uh... mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I can drop, you know, some I, I can, about that. I, I, I can drop a paper in the in the chat where it's done with the cyclic okay. homology. Okay. The other thing is, however, for the for the solutions, um, you might not care whether it's cyclic or not, because um, in solutions, how to say, the, the cyclicity is important for in order to formulate an action, because uh, yes, you need yes. to have the more. But for the solutions, probably it's not so important. So uh, there's a question, actually, with mapping solutions to solutions, would it be easier for you if you didn't insist on having cyclic homomor uh, homomorphisms? Yes, that's why also we use this this non cyclic homomorphisms also. Ah, for the solutions you yes. don't use yes. it. For the solutions ah, it's fine. Yeah, we, we, yes. Mm -hmm. um, then the other thing is the singularity. I think I understand what you meant about the um, regularizing singularities. So are these the singularities which you are referring to were they related to loops or they were related to in the classical solution? Uh, no, they were uh, in, in the classical theory. So what I, for example, we had in mind was uh, those identity-like solutions that you, where you cannot compute the action because you get a, uh, basically a world sheet of vanishing uh, surface. Okay, I see, okay. So it's not, yeah, not, not related to loops. So, and is there some intuition why, why stops could help to, to regulate them. Yeah, there is, because, um, because for, for example, when I apply a, a stop product on, on, a, on such an identity-like solution, I get something which is not identity-like, which has a non-vanishing uh, width of, of virtual surface, because those mm -hmm. stops are attached. 
So I have a chance to compute a well-defined action on a well-defined, let's say, cylinder with on a circumference which, which is not zero. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Thanks. but I think that will be still hard, like because again there is this issues that you will induce infinitely many states, right? And you have to compute that action by summing that series. So in a yes, sense that yes. you should well, one thing well, to the it, it will be yes, it, it will be an infinite series. So it's probably hard to do it exactly. One can do it. Uh, um, okay. One can do it to some order and see if you uh, uh, approach the, the value you expect or, or not. Or, yeah. or maybe you can find a, a way to, to to some the infinite series, yes. Okay, I have I have a crazy uh, like a question maybe to wake. But say that we have a series, you know, is there a, like a notion of party approximation in that lambda? Like, can we come somehow cook up something like that, or no? I don't know. Um, yeah, like, I don't know either. Uh, if, if, if there is, I think it's very non non trivial. So, yeah. no, why not? Okay. Uh, so, so, but a series is always trivial. But I think it's hard to find higher orders in lambda. It's mm. it's really yeah, it question will be is that. Yeah, my, my concern is that uh, you see the you will have a bunch of fields, right? Uh, expanded in Lambda. And like now you have to do multi-dimensional party, which will be quite non-trivial and even not well defined probably. So I was wondering if there's a party just directly on string field. Um like just keeping two orders, three orders even in Lambda. You mean pade directly on string fields? Yeah, like because I mean, I, I don't know, like again, like if you have like a single one dimensional party, everything is fine. But say that you have two, two say that you want to do some two dimensional party, things get very uh, challenging. So uh, if you just try to expand, uh, expand the string field in components, you will encounter this issue. So I was wondering that uh, somehow like you can work with the string field directly uh, to doing party. You see what I mean? Or well, not? not exactly, because in, in Pade, you are approximating yeah. by a rational function. So you have some polynomials in the denominator numerator. So your polynomials yes. are polynomials in lambda or polynomials in the string field. And when you say about yeah, higher dimensionality, good. you mean, uh, what do you mean by higher dimensionality? Uh, good. So I think I'm confused. So like I was wondering, OK, maybe I should clarify. We are. Yeah, if you are if you are doing uh, party in lambda, this is possible, right? Yeah. Okay, then then it's fair. I was considering the expansion and string field, but mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. I think that's not applicable. Okay, fair. Thank you. Okay. Somewhat unrelated question, probably a stupid question. Is there is there something similar like hyperbolic vertices for for disks? Also, is there a version of something like this that you have? Hmm. Um, or maybe. I don't know. Um, like maybe other uh, What do you have in mind exactly? You know something like uh, some some analog of hyperbolic vertices for for open string. Yeah, absolutely. Right, there are hyperbolic vertices on punctive disk, so you just use the condition. That uh, you know the the distal be the, the geodesic between the boundaries are greater than some length. And, and to your that, that defines an idea, it, yeah. how how the Witten string theory would be transformed if you used hyper hyperbolic vertices on the disk. Uh, so um, I mean, it's certainly not a homological perturbation lemma, right? It's, it's it's no. uh, it's just uh, like a uh, yeah it's it's a it's one that the hot and Zwiba did like you write this f and the basically homotopy is the where you um, change this border length for the hyperbolic vertices you know mm -hmm. there's some like a, a homotopy in moduli space it's like exactly what Georg did and uh, Georg and Martin did for the uh, the the usual stops and the f. 
So it's the idea is similar. If you want to map solutions, so. Thanks. Any other question? Well, if not, let us thank Georg once more. Thanks.